going to keep me away. Hallelujah. While you're finding Luke chapter 16, Luke chapter 16, may I just say uh, my goodbyes and thank yous uh, now, not that we can't do that at the end of the service and get a bunch of hugs and stuff. Um, but I'm leaving after the service to uh, have uh, an appointment tomorrow with my pastor and then we got to just do this all over again. So we got to wash some clothes, man, and uh, get ready to go. And boy, I'll tell you, um, there are very few places that I come to on Wednesday night that I'm um, amazingly sad about. This is one of those. Um, you are family to me. And I just want to say thank you for loving me. Thank you for letting me come. Um, I uh, just love this place. I, I love your pastor. I say this every year that I'm here. Uh, Keith and Debbie, I am so proud of you. Uh, amazingly proud of you. And can you just uh, agree with me? Y'all are so blessed to have them, man. Yeah, go ahead. Um, man, one of my top five buddies of all time, and um, thank you, bud. Appreciate you. Thank you so very much, uh, many of you, Wally and Debbie, for letting me hang out. Um, I'm glad y'all got up at six to cook breakfast because uh, I've been knocking at your door, you know, and it was good stuff. The fellowship that we had, the accommodations that we had were amazing. Thank you, Ruth and Dwayne, for making me look good, and uh, thank you for what all that you do back there. Um, thank you, Ms. Alice. Listen, y'all might as well just vote at the next business meeting to put Alice's kitchen right there, just, you know, son, way to run it, what way to run a kitchen, ma'am, and, uh, and you know what, I went in there the other night, and they didn't throw me out, man, I know that's the holy of holies at, at O'Brien Baptist Church, and I, listen, that, that made me feel real good, thank you, thank you, Miss Beth, um, thank you for all that assisted her, um, thank you, Seth, and, and Carrie, and, Anna and Carol, and um, just thank you so much, choir. I love a choir. Choir, y'all did awesome. Um, thank you for uh, uh, being up here um, every night, and uh, I just praise God for you so very, very much. Thank you for whatever the love offering will be. Know that I'll be using it for the glory of the Lord, and uh, I am just so excited uh, to be coming back uh, very soon, and I'll bring Pauline. Sweet Pea will stay at home but I'll bring Pauline, and I look forward to her. Uh, she's been here once, but I look forward to her to hanging out. Busy time of the year for me. Be going from Nashville to, to Virginia to Jacksonville and places in between. And uh, I, I want to tell you about one place I'll be, and then we'll preach. And I'm not expecting you to come. Uh, I, I'm not even going to ask you to come, just making you aware. Last Sunday of October... That is October 29th to the first day of November 2023. So, so what, a couple of months from now, um, I'll be over at Pine Level Missionary Baptist Church in Dowling Park. And I know it's not just like just down the road, but I'm just saying that uh, I'll be there in revival, been with those great people uh, two other times that enjoy Pastor Lester and, and the people there. If you get a chance, October 29th to November 1st, and along the way I'll be letting Pastor know uh, whenever I come back to this area. Luke chapter 16. Tonight I want to preach on this subject. Horrible hell. Before a word is spoken or a verse is read, I, I would like to ask um, my family here at O'Brien Baptist Church to forgive me. Um, this is six years, five sermons, um, each revival, I uh, came one time when you, Brother Keith had a milestone in his ministry. And so 31 sermons soon to be preached in this church by me. And not one time in those 31 sermons here at O'Brien have I preached on hell. And I know better than that. So here's the bottom line. Most scholars believe that Jesus preached on hell more than anybody that ever preached. He, they believe that he preached on hell more than he preached on heaven, they believe he preached on hell more than any other of the New Testament writers, and I know better than that. I, I know there's other subjects, please. 
I, I know that. I, I, I know that Jesus died to save us so that we could have a personal relationship with him. And we have spent four of our services in revival. But I just want to say that I'm sorry. But yet, even though, Pastor, this will be the first time I preached on hell here at O'Brien, it'll be one time more than some ever preach on hell in their lifetime. And I'm here to tell you I'm not afraid of it. I'm not ashamed of it. I, 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 it's not the, 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 the greatest subject, if you will. It, 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 that, that there's going to be some gloom and, and doom in the message because that's what hell is. But hell needs to be preached. And I want to apologize that I haven't here before, but I'm going to tonight. Hallelujah to the name of the Lord. Luke chapter 16. There's a story here. I will not read all the verses now but I will pick up at the beginning. Find verse number 19, and would you stand please and honor the reading of the Word of God, and like you've done in two of the uh, three of the other four messages, stay right here. We're not going anywhere. Luke chapter 16. Jesus is speaking, and the greatest preacher of all says, there was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. But there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, full of sores, who was laid at his gate, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. So it was that the beggar died. It was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And being in torments in hell, he lifted up his eyes, saw Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom, and he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus that he might dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. I'm preaching on this subject, horrible hell. Would you be seated all over the building with your Bibles open in your laps? I love the story of the college sophomore who was on his way to his ornithology class, the study of birds. He was so excited about this particular day because it was the final exam day and he was pumped because he had studied. He was prepared this exam that he was about to take was going to be half of his grade and he knew that it was important. He had done well with the other half of his grade. He wanted to make an A in his ornithology class and he couldn't wait. So he gets to his class and uh, all of a sudden he is just freaking out. As the professor passes out the test, he turned it over and he found out as you look through it, there's no true-false questions. There's no fill-in-the-blank. There's no multiple choice. There's no matching. There's no essay questions. Here's what the test consisted of. There were 25 pictures of bird legs. And there was a line underneath the feet of the birds, and he had to identify the name of the bird that went with the legs. And he was truly upset. Now, here's why he was upset. He had prepared like he had never prepared for a test before, and he ain't seen 25 pictures of bird legs in the books. He had been 16 weeks in the semester. They haven't talked about those 25 different. They look the same, man. And all of a sudden, those great big drops of perspiration and the heart just started pounding, and he goes, oh, my gosh, I'm done. So after a while of being frustrated, he didn't want to interrupt everybody else taking the test, and so he got the professor's attention and went up and he said, Sir, I, I, I'm sorry. I, I, I just don't think this test is fair. I, we didn't discuss these 25 bird legs. Are you kidding me? And I studied on. I pulled an all-nighter last night, and I'm ready for this test, and I don't agree with this test at all. And the professor said, Well, son, here's how it is. That's the test. It's one half of your grade. Do the best that you can. After all... Just guess, because it's really not too difficult to figure out. 
Well, he's muttering under his breath back to his chair. He tried, but 30 seconds into it, he set his pencil down. He turned the paper over. He grabbed his backpack, and he headed out the door. And the professor said, excuse me, young man, where are you going? He said, I've had it, sir. I'm not taking the test, okay? Understand that if you don't take the test, it's no longer half of your grade. It's all of your grade, and you're going to get a big fat F. And he kept on walking. He said, hold on, sir. One other question. As you can tell, we got a large class. I got four other large classes. I want to be sure that I have your name right so I can put the proper grade by your name. What is your name? And the young man thought for a minute. He set the backpack down. He rolled up his pants legs, removed his shoes and socks, said, go ahead and guess. It's not hard to figure out. <laughs> Pastor and I were just running through some stuff before the service. That's how some people deal with the Word of God. I don't know. They make their decision on their tradition as a denomination. They make their decision on dissing and maybe I'll figure it out. And I'm going to tell you, I'm just going to go ahead and say this is my last night. If I offend somebody, I, you, you can send me home. Anyway, understand this. Dumb people just ha can't figure it out, man. And I'm going to tell you what you have in your hand is the Word of God. And the Word of God can be taught and the Word of God can be understood. I don't know all the answers to all the questions. There are certainly mysteries in Scripture. There's a couple of mysteries in the story tonight. But I'm going to tell you what. We need to learn the Word of God so that we can be more victorious in Him every day. Pew Research is a new firm that does data and statistic on churches. And they recently did a survey last fall of 6,000 evangelical professing Christian church-going people. Questions of the biblical and spiritual nature. 6,000 of evangelical Christians. Watch this. While 94% of them believed in the existence of heaven, only 62% of them believed that there really was a real hell. I'm not finished. 60% of them believed, only 60% of them, believed that Satan was real and not just a symbol of evil. 30% of them believed in reincarnation. You're going to love this next one. 22% of them believed that Jesus was a sinner while he was on this earth. And you ain't heard nothing yet. Only 10% surveyed ever remember hearing a sermon on hell from the pulpit of the church they attended as far back as they can remember. Let me just flip the number, okay? 90% couldn't ever remember Hearing about hell. Pastor, let me tell you where the new 21st century preaching movement has gone about hell. Here it is. Let's don't deny hell. Let's just not talk about it anymore. Now, wait a minute. This guy and this guy, we know preachers personally who don't believe in a literal hell. They believe it's allegorical or, or figurative. They, uh, they, they believe it's metaphorical or, or, or symbolic. Uh, uh, they, they don't believe that it's real. But I, but I need you to understand that there are many who are thinking in this modern age, we're in 2023, in this modern age of thinking, when you can be all that you can be or whatever you dream is yours or don't worry, be happy, why would you waste your time spending any moments thinking about an eternal punishment and a lake of fire. Rob Bell, a 53-year-old former pastor of the 10,000-member mega church in Michigan, Mars Hills Bible Church, is one of the hell deniers. And the only reason I'm mentioning his name, it's well documented. He's one of the top, if you will, hell deniers of preachers all over the world. Do you know what Rob Bell's reason for believing that there is no hell he said of the 31,173 verses in the Word of God, only about 20 of them even mention hell, so I'm going to deny it, he said. i got a couple of questions, Rob. First question is, how many times does the Word of God have to say something before it's real, man? Second of all, Rob, you got your figures wrong. First of all, the word hell itself all by itself appears 53 times in the Word of God. And do you know there's 110 more references to this place like the lake of fire, eternal punishment, a place of torment. And are you ready for this? Jesus says something in 70 of those 110 references. 
So let me just preach, okay? My friend, the reality of the existence of hell is not de dependent upon the wisdom of some theological scholar or the thoughts of some preacher. It's the truth of the word of Almighty God. Romans 3, 4 says it better than I can say it myself. Let God be true and man a liar. Hell exists because the word of God says so. Let me talk to you about the new movement further, about let's just deny it, uh, not deny it, let's just not talk about it. Here's the thought. Let's throw buckets of water on hell to put the fire out so we don't have to dwell on it. Do you know what an anonymous preacher said? And I won't give you his name. Do you know what he said? We got a different brand in 2023 for reaching people with the gospel instead of that old archaic way of threatening them that if Jesus isn't your Savior, you're going to die and go to hell. Here's what another preacher said. Y'all going to love this. Hell just isn't a sexy subject anymore. Isn't that special? The pastor of the third largest church in America, I won't give you his name, but Joel Osteen preaches to just about 45,000 people in just his church, not counting the millions across the world every Sunday. And the only reason why I mention his name, this has been documented for years. Long ago when he had that infamous interview with Larry King live, when Larry said, Joel, why don't you preach on hell and repentance? And here's what the man said. Larry, it's not that I disbelieve in those subjects. I don't preach on those subjects because that is not my thing. My thing is to encourage people and lift them up, not beat them up because they already come to church that way. So many of them already feel guilty enough. Yeah, Joel is called sinners. We're all sinners saved by the grace of God that know him, and everyone has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. See, here's my problem with that kind of garbage, okay? We preachers, and there's about four or five of us in the building. Guys, we've been given a charge, have we not? From 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2, and three words tell us to preach the word. See, here's what I'm convinced that means. I'm convinced that means all of it, not just some of it. I think that means not what folks want to hear, but what folks need to be here. Brother Wally, not just the good part, but all of it, because it's all good. Preach the word. Of, preach it from Genesis to the maps, preacher. Preach all of it. See, there's three words in 2 Timothy chapter 4 that we preachers have been charged with. And I'll get back to the story. Watch this. Reprove, rebuke, exhort. The word reprove means to convince and convict. The word rebuke means to give a, a charge. And the word exhort means to comfort and encourage. There it is, Joel. Preach the entire counsel of the word of God and let the uncompromising message of this book do what it can do, and that is change lives. I mean, it's interesting that hell has become a bad word in 2023. It's not a bad word at a ball game, but it's a bad word in the Bible. It doesn't, people don't have a problem using that word during the week as long as the preacher doesn't use it on the weekend. See, here's what the deal is. People will use it as a profane and a curse word, but it's not okay as a pulpit and a church word. And here's the big one. Folks don't mind telling somebody to go there as long as this guy doesn't tell anybody how not to go there. Isn't that sad? But I got news for you. The pulpits can ignore it, but it ain't going anywhere. The foolish can deny it, but it won't cool it off a degree once they get there. The cold-hearted man can laugh it off but hell is no laughing matter. It's not a joke, it's a judgment. It is not a picture, it's a place. It's not just a word, it's a warning. It's horrible, and we need to avoid it as much as we possibly can. In fact, we need to avoid it at all costs. So let's talk about it. Horrible hell. Why is hell horrible? Three reasons. Watch the first slide. Reason number one. Hell is horrible because hell is a physical place. It's a physical place. It's a horrible place because it's a real place. All right, watch the story. 
it begins to unfold. Jesus teaches a story about two men, the story about the rich man and the story about the beggar. Now, there's a little controversy whether this is a parable or not. Can I just say, I don't care. It's a story. Jesus taught in parables. Oh, I love that. We learned since we were this tall in church that a parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. The word actually means to lay alongside of. It's actually a story sometimes that Jesus made up, but he would apply spiritual truth to it so they could apply it to their lives. Let me tell you why I don't care whether it's a parable or not. It's like last night's story. Was last night's story a parable? I don't care. The bottom line is last night's story really happened and God is really a miracle working God. And so as we look at the story tonight, I don't care whether it's a parable or not. It's a true story. Yeah, Jesus would teach fictitious stories. Yeah, Jesus would use symbolic language with the words as, if, or like to demonstrate spiritual application. But whether this is a parable or not, it's a real life story. And let me tell you why I know it's a real life story. First of all, do you notice one of the two men has a name? I mean, if it was just a made up story, he'd have said the rich man and the beggar. Last night's lad never got a name, did he? He had a name. We just don't know what his name is. God knows his name. Amen. That's all that matters. But in this story, the beggar has a name. And just like Keith and Ron are common names in 2023 and Josh and John and, 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 and on and on and on. Lazarus was a common name in Jesus' name. We got a guy with a real live name. Second of all, can I tell you why I think this, why I know this is the true story? Watch this. Verse 22, the beggar died and was carried into Abraham's bosom, a reference to paradise then and heaven now, and the rich man also died and I love what verse 23 says. I'm sorry he's there, but I love what it says. He went to hell. It doesn't say he went to a place that seemed like hell. He went to a place that looked like hell. He went to a place that had glimpses and, and, and pictures of hell. No, he's in a real life place. There's a real life place called heaven. It's paradise here. Jesus is about to empty it out and make it heaven. There's a real life place and the place is called hell as well. And then notice the conscious awareness and the surroundings where they are. Here's a controversial part. Keith and I talked about it briefly this morning. The rich man's in hell, and he sees Abraham and Lazarus in heaven. Now, we can't see people in heaven while we're here on this earth. What do you think it is? I don't know. I really don't. Some think that Luke used poetic license and was free to say that and the Holy Spirit guarded what he said because Luke was just trying to get you to see the obvious a real mess of, of a real person in a real place. Some think that because paradise was temporary that you could see somebody once it became fixed and eternal because of that's what heaven is that you no longer do. I don't know. I do care. But here's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking, let's not get caught up in all of that. Let's just see the consciousness of this man. Verse 23 says, being in torment. It doesn't say as if he's in torment. Verse 23 isn't a figurative or a symbolic torment. Verse 25 says, the rich man is tormented while Lazarus is comforted. Look at those five senses. He sees, he knows, he feels, he speaks, he's aware. There's no place like hell, and you need to understand it is real. Everybody's got an opinion about everything. A lot of people have an opinion about hell. I heard this, this uh, said this week about the situation in Maui. It's hell. Can I just say this? Been there. It is gorgeous. And I'm sure if I went back there tomorrow, it's not gorgeous. I understand that. But Maui isn't hell. Maui is Maui and hell is hell. General Sermon in the Civil War. General Sherman said, war is hell. Hey, General, I get it. Ah, war is horrible. But war is war and hell is hell. So I'm just trying to get you to understand. We need to understand. Hell stands alone, man. And just like there's nothing like heaven, there's no place like hell. Just like uh, heaven can't, 
can't have enough wonderful metaphors and descriptive words said about it. There's not enough horribleness to describe this place called hell. Uh, I told you that I, I'm, I'm a Gator, Gator season ticket holder and, and I get a chance to go see Florida play when, I, when I'm not traveling and, and that, that's becoming less and less uh, down through the years. But I remember years ago, I'm sitting in my seat, been going there for a long, long time, and I was sitting in my seat, and we were playing um, the University of Miami, and it was September, it was hot, it was hot, you know how hot it is in September in Florida, and I'm telling you, it was hot. That was back when the swamp had artificial turf, guys, and they measured uh, the temperature on the field, and uh, the temperature was over 120 degrees. Later, they reported about 75 people needing EMS attention in the crowd. It was that out. It was hot, it was hot, it was hot, it was hot. About that time, one of the Gator star players got injured and the place got real quiet. And I'm sitting there and I remember it to this day, Keith. And it's been 30 years ago, man. And all of a sudden, somebody yelled out, It's hot as, and he said the word, hell. It's hot as, and he said the word, hell. And about three rows down from me, about an 85, 90 year old grandmother I got to know her real well. Here's what she yelled out No, sonny boy, it ain't that hot. To, because there's no place as hot as hell. And I said, you go, Granny. You tell him the truth. Likewise, my wife and I were in Massachusetts one Christmas. We go every year. I'm telling you every night. It's single digits at Christmas time. There's always a snowstorm. and It's always uh, uh, four or five days we're in single. It is just cold at Christmas time. My wife and I were coming down the elevator of our hotel room ready to go see some of Pauline's family for Christmas and it was like probably two degrees that we come out of the elevator and a man comes in shaking his jacket off and he says it's cold as and he said the word hell it's cold as and as I'm going out the door I said hold on Pauline I got to talk to this guy <laughs> because I'm going to tell you he has no clue what he's talking about Everybody w wants to describe hell. Hell is indescribable. Do you understand? It's a real place. Listen to some of the real places that Scripture talks about or the, the, the things that Scripture talks about about the real place. Revelation 20, verse 15. Whose ever name is not found written in the book of life was cast into, are you ready? The lake of fire. Boy, I'm in, I'm, I'm in the, 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 the fishing capital. Lord, you guys love to go fishing. How would you like to go fishing in a lake of fire? It's, all, it's impossible, obviously. Can you imagine spending an eternity just bobbing like a cork in a lake of fire? Listen to the descriptions. I used this last night. Matthew 23, verse 33. Jesus told the scribes and the Pharisees, serpents and root of vipers. Watch this. How can you escape the, ready, damnation of hell? And then listen to this. Mark chapter 9, verse 44, it calls a place where the worm doesn't die and the fire is not quenched. The fire just burns and burns and burns and burns and nothing gets burned up in the place. It is an incredible standalone place. There's no other place like it. It's been called a myth. I was listening to some guy on, the, on YouTube describe it as a dimensional thing. I have no idea what he's talking about. Talk about it's just a conscious thing. Yeah, it's conscious, all right. But there's no place like it. In fact, do you know there's a concept called the law of, of beliefs that states that whatever one believes, it's true because it's real to you? I thought we decided that the law of gravity was the law of gravity a long time ago. Watch the law of gravity. Okay, that's the law of gravity, all right? And yet Dr. Brian Keating, and I mentioned his name only because this cosmologist and, and, and professor of astrophysics is all over the Internet because he started denying the law of gravity. And he's got millions that follow him. But Dr. Brian Keating, if you get a ladder on the side of your house and walk up to your roof and get on your roof and walk up to the edge, you can say, I don't believe in the law of gravity. I don't believe in the law of gravity. I don't believe in the law of gravity and say it 3,000 more times and you take a step forward and you're going to have to believe in the law of gravity. I thought we settled the earth is round a long time ago. 
by Aristotle and Pythagoras and smart guys like that. Even Isaiah 40 verse 22 says, He sits on the circle of the earth. The earth is round, okay? And yet, are y'all ready for this? A decade ago, noted rapper B.O.B. started a GoFundMe page to raise money to prove that the earth was a sphere and it looked like a frisbee. Are you ready? Because of that, the flat earthers have emerged by the millions. 11 million of them live in Brazil alone and they have a, an annual conference of hundreds of thousands who believe the earth is flat. And finally, um, I don't know what we decided about Bigfoot, but do you understand 30 million American adults believe in Bigfoot? I think about 29 million of them live in the state of Florida, I'm so sorry to say. The law of beliefs. Whatever one wants to believe, it's true. But ladies and gentlemen, hell is true. Hell is real not because of the law of the belief, but because of the law of Scripture. The Bible says it is. It's not a dream. It's not a fantasy. It's not a vision. It's not a symbolic anything. It's a real place. Horrible hell is a physical place. Let me give you the second one. Not only is it a physical place, notice the next slide. Hell is a punishing place. Verse 24 says, And the rich man cried, and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus that he might dip the tip of his finger in water and just put one drop on my tongue. There are seven different Greek words for the one word cry, cries, cried, or crying. And that's because there are different emotions of crying. One cries with tears of joy. One cries with tears of grief at the death of a friend. One cries out with a loud voice. And then one also cries out due to the agony of pain. Four times in this story, you'll see the word torment, torments, or tormented that come from two Greek words that speak about the intense torture of pain. We spoke about Mark 9, 44, where the worm doesn't die. Watch this, guys. This man is burning in hell, but he's not being burned up. Have you ever been burnt? The hand draws back quicker than you can imagine. This guy is living in it. And it's not burning him up, but he's going to continue to be in pain. Mark says the fire is not quenched, that word Quench means to satisfy one thirst and to extreme, extinguish flames of fire, and neither are happening here. The man is dying for this, and the man is trying to get out of the fire, and neither are happening. And by the way, can I just throw this in for no charge? The beggar who couldn't get dogs to pay attention for, to him is living in heaven, and the rich man who probably kicked the beggar out of the way under the table, is now the beggar, begging for just a drop of water. You know, I, 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 I love this point, but, 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 but I'm going to struggle with this point because I can't describe it. It's been hot, has it not? Keith, maybe we should have preached this sermon on, on an afternoon 97 degrees with the humature of 110 outside, maybe you would have got a little bit of a feel for it. And I'm not talking about you in general. I know the body of Christ knows what I'm talking about. Maybe we should have just cut the air. I, I was at Wally's getting ready and we lost power. And for about uh, an hour later, I had to get out. I was sweating and I couldn't see my nose. But more than anything, I was just sweating. And, and, and Wally, I think it was like 81 in the trailer. Isn't that hot? That's hot, man. Are you kidding me? So I'm, I'm having a difficult time, I'm sure, trying to get you to see, but maybe this will get you to see the one word forever, forever pain, forever agony, forever torment, forever punishment, forever. We get to hurting and there's something 
to cure the hurt and the pain subsides, but in hell it's forever pain. Do you know it never gets better? If I have the privilege of coming back to O'Brien year after year and I preach another sermon on hell, hell won't be any better when I preach on it next time. The home in hell is not a fixer-upper. And where you put an air conditioner in and, and fresh carpet and slap a fresh coat of paint on it and then sell it. No, it doesn't get any better. And what I'm trying to describe, just add a hundred billion times a hundred billion and throw in another hundred billion times a hundred billion and you might have a, just a little drop of water of what this is about. So I don't know what your greatest fear is. Uh, um, uh, I love the Gators football team, but I don't like the, the crawling kind, man. And, and, and there he is. I, 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 I told you that uh, they've been frequenting my yard, and typically, and I'm not, I'm not Steve Irwin the second here, but, but generally, they, that we got uh, where, where, where we live, we live in an 1100 uh, uh, house uh, uh, subdivision, and everybody's got a retention pond. And there's a drain that goes underneath the street to the other retention pond across the street. And gators are just about as scared of you. About 10 months of the year, 9 months of the year, and they go underneath the, dra the, the, the drain to some other body of water. And you leave them alone, they typically leave you alone. But 3 months out of the year, well, they're mating and they, ain't, they don't care. And they don't go under the drain, but they cross my yard. But I'll never forget... Pauline and I have been living in our house for 28 years and we had just built it and moved into it and I was mowing the lawn and, and uh, Pastor, I'm mowing in the backyard and there's a retention pond and there's a tree and I go to turn and there's, there's, there's a gator right there. And uh, how, how long was he? I, 57 feet long. I don't know. He, he, he was a monster. I think I scared him and he scared me and he went splashing in the water. I'd love to tell you I want something like this. Yeah. Yeah, you don't mess with me. You hear me? Yeah. You need to jump in that water and don't. No, that's not what happened, man. I screamed like a little girl all the way back to my house for Pauline to save the day. And then I locked the door so he couldn't unlock it. And then here's what I did. I left the lawnmower running till it ran out of gas. And I promise you, I've never mowed another lawn ever again. I, I, I haven't. I haven't. I promise you. I, 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 I don't know. I, are you afraid of snakes? Maybe that'll do it. Afraid of spiders? I, I don't know. Spinach? I mean, I don't know. But what is your greatest fear? Maybe you could just get an idea. Hey, hey, guys, if you have a pierced fear, I, I'm, I'm not. I'm, look, I'm, I'm just telling a story, okay? But my son was in a rebellious stage when he was 14 and his buddies were piercing their ear. And he said, Dad, can I pierce my ear? And I said, absolutely not. I'm from the old school and we're not piercing our ears. And, and as long as you live under this roof, you're not. So I'm going to tell you what my son did. My son pierced his own ear. Okay? Now, here's how it happened. Unbeknownst to me, he put a straight pin through it. And then he put a bandage over it and pressure on it so it would continue to go through the year. And then he came to, to supper, Brother Keith, and Mom and I are sitting there, and this guy's got this big old bandage here like he's hiding it, okay? And tears are flowing down his... I knew what he had done. And Mama says, do we punish him? I said, no, I think he's getting punished enough right there. I don't know. I talked about my hip surgery. It's great to not have pain, man but to have forever pain. I have uh, experienced a lot of bumps and bruises, and heartaches and heartbreaks in the trials and tribulations of my life. Pastor Keith knows what I'm talking about with the first one. When I was 11 years old, I fell out of a, uh, an oak tree in the backyard of, of the parsonage at, with the, the church on the other side. So we, we lived behind the church. My dad was my pastor, and I fell out of a, 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 an oak tree 25 feet and broke the femur bone in four places and it came through the skin and it picked up dirt and with that was infection and I basically was in a body cast for about a year and I was homeschooled when homeschool wasn't cool and and I, 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 I've experienced that. It was, it was tremendous pain laying there. Um, Fourteen years ago before I met you guys I had an aneurysm repair and they discovered an aneurysm growing at the base of my aorta and 
and, and God and the doctors fixed it. And we've been going every year. And last year the doctor told me, Ron, it don't even look like you've ever had surgery. And I said, God is good. But I guess the, 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 the single greatest pain that, that I've ever been in, and it's almost silly to talk about it unless you've experienced the same thing, is, is uh, I had four gallbladder attacks. And uh, let me describe them to you. Uh, uh, I, I love fried chicken, man. And uh, I love Kentucky fried chicken. And I, our big date is on Friday night where Pauline and I go to Publix, Walmart, and, 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 we, and we might go out and grab something to eat. And, and so we grabbed some Kentucky fried chicken and came home. It was a Friday night. About an hour and a half, it, it kind of backed up on me, okay? And I was, in, I, just, I was in pain. I was in pain. And I didn't know... I knew where the gallbladder was and where it's not now, hallelujah, but, but it, this whole side, I was just in pain. And, and so I took two Excedrin, and Paulie said, you want to go to the ER? And I said, no, this Friday night, that's where the crazy people are. And, and I'm just telling the truth, okay? The gunshot wounds and the drug overdoses. And I said, no, I'd rather. And about five, six hours later, it subsided. The next time I had a gallbladder attack, I was preaching in North Carolina, and uh, it hit me right as I was leaving the hotel to go preach. I, Pastor, I didn't have to worry about being animated that night. I was just all over the stage. I was, in, I was in pain. I was trying to get the doctor to check to see what the problem was, and I had my third gallbladder attack while I was, uh, after I came home from preaching in Lake City, and I called the doctor the next morning as I was heading home, and, and we set up an appointment, and the doctor said, you got a gallbladder that needs to come out. I'll never forget what he said. He said, you love fried chicken, don't you? And I said, yes, sir. And he said, it's backed up on you. That's pretty gross, is it not? We scheduled the gallbladder surgery the next Friday. And guess how I, 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 what I did after I, I um, got the word? I, I picked up some Kentucky Fried Chicken and went home. And it hit me the fourth time. And I turned to Pauline. I said, let's go to the ER. And she said, it's Friday night. I said, yeah, I don't care. I'm not going to go through what I went through before. I remember the, the ride to the uh, hospital was 15 minutes felt like 15 hours. I could not sit. I could not stand. I could not lay down. The pain was just horrible. I, I walked into the ER. She went to get the paperwork, started filling out the paperwork, and I'm just walking the floor, man. And I started getting the attention of the people that, 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 that had real concerns. And, and, and I'm leaning up against the wall just screaming out. And this lady came and offered me her pink pill. And, 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 and Pauline came over with the paperwork. I said, she goes, honey, you got to fill out this paperwork. I said, get rid of the pill lady right now. And, and then this other lady came, went up to the, 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 the nurse and she said, listen, I know I've got a knife wound right here, but would you take that man first? And I mean, listen, I was putting on a show and didn't mean to put on a show. In fact, when they called me to the back, everybody in the ER stood up and they applauded. And I remember getting to the back and I said, look, my surgery scheduled next week. Take it out tonight. I don't care, but I need drugs and I need drugs now. The good kind. And I'll never forget the IV, and I counted to like 10, and the pain was gone. I'm going to preach, okay? We've got something on this side of hell that can take care of pain. If it's a little pain, the aspirin bottle says for temporary relief due to pain. If it's a little stronger pain, there's a little stronger medication. If surgery is needed, they put you under the anesthesia and you don't feel a thing, and it's removed. In hell, there is no relief ever. No Motrin. There is no, no medicine. There is no prescription. There is nothing. The pain will last forever. It's a punishing place. It's a physical place. And I close with the third thing. It is a permanent. Place. Pick up the story at verse number 26. Notice what it says. And besides all this, Abraham's speaking, Jesus is actually speaking, and beside all this, between us and you, there's a great gulf fixed. So that those who want to pass from here to you can't, nor can those from there pass to us. Let me give you two words, describe them, and I'm done. The word gulf, only time it appears in the Word of God, means empty place. It's the Greek word chasma where we get our English word chasm from. It's a cavity, a crater, a hole. The word fixed means a limited boundary. 
And when you put it together, here's what it says. Hell is a place all by itself. And once you check in, you don't check out. There's not only no relief in hell, there's no release from hell. It is a permanent place. A little discussion goes on. Hey, send the beggar that he might dip his finger in water and touch my tongue. And Abraham said he can't. He can't get to you. The further discussion is over the rich man's five brothers. Well, would somebody get them the gospel so that they don't come to this place? He can't even talk to them. There's no conference call. There's no opportunity for him to talk to them about trusting in Jesus as their Savior and presenting them the gospel. It's a permanent place. It's a fixed place. Pastor, I, I, I don't, man, I'm not like this really emotional guy, but th 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 this is numbing to me. I, I know Jesus as my Savior. I know where I'm going, and this is suffocating to me. I remember one of the greatest things about the four months of recovery from COVID is I got to eventually go outside at my pool area and just walk around and smell the air, man. Pauline said, you want to go to Walmart? I go, well, yes, let's go to Walmart. Are you kidding me? Who wants to go there? I guess they call that cabin fever. I don't know. But I'm telling you, there's no parole in hell. There's no time off for good behavior in hell. There's no visitation in hell. Nobody comes to see you. Once the iron gate closes, it doesn't open again. And you are there forever. In Dante's uh, epic 14th century poem, Inferno, he writes an inscription on the gates of hell in that poem. Google it, you'll find out it says, Abandon all hope to those that enter. And that pretty much says it all. Abandon all hope to those who enter. My gosh, man. Suffering in hell, everlasting. Solitude in hell, eternal. Agony in hell, forever. Alienation in hell, and it never, ever changes. Distress, desertion, it is fixed. And there'll never be an opportunity to get a second chance to change your misery of solution and uh, of separation and seclusion. You know, it always gets better on this side. My, 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 my surgery, uh, I recovered and it got better. My COVID left me and it got better. There's always hope on this side. I put in my, my, my application at 47 jobs, Brother Ron, and I finally got a call that I'm going. To go back to work. There's always the possibility. On this side, there is no chance for anything. It's gone and it will never change. Aaron Ralston, Ralston, you might remember the story, is now a 47-year-old former extreme mountain climber in Aspen, Colorado. On April 26, 2003, Aaron was coming down the John, the Blue John Canyon in, all, in Utah, several thousand feet. And he got to a place that there was uh, no other place to go further except this, this I'm, I'm trying to describe it, let, let me do it this way, except this crevice, okay? So he was going to fit down the crevice about the width of his body. Ten feet, he was going to hit the ground. Then he was going to maybe do the rope thing and propel down 60 more feet. And then there was an eight-mile jog back to his house or back to the car so he could go home. Now, he's an extreme mountain climber. No big deal, right? So here's how it looked. Here's the crevice, and, and, and here's the ledge, and here's the ledge. Here's the 10-foot drop. So he said, okay, I got to drop straight down So because there's about a 12-foot gap. And, or, I, mean, I, mean, I, mean, I mean, about a 3-foot a, a, a gap, maybe wider than my body, and I'm going to drop down, hit the ground, 
and then I'm going to do the rest. Ten feet, I want to make sure I don't break my ankles. So he sat there and he thought about it. And right before he dropped down, a boulder weighed, oh, I don't know, 800 pounds, shifted, moved, and fell on his right hand. I'm sure it hurt half a ton. But all of a sudden, Aaron Ralston said, "Uh uh-oh, I can't move. I can't propel down because a boulder is on top of my hand. Here's what happened the next five days. He first uh, took the left hand and tried to move the boulder. That wasn't going to happen. He had a multi-purpose pocket knife and he began to chip away at the boulder and that was going to be a lot of chipping. And then he thought, well, I've got a rope in my backpack and he was able to to reach his foot over and get the backpack and put it in this hand and and he was able to get the rope out and he he formed, you know, one-handed. He got the knot just right and he threw the rope on top of the boulder and he pulled and he pulled and he pulled and he pulled and the boulder didn't move. And three days later, he was still there. Exhaustion, obviously, dehydration now was setting in and he knew there was only one thing to do. He was going to have to amputate his arm from his hand. He was going to have to cut his arm off and leave his hand. Fall down in the little crevice that was barely wider than him, and then do the rest that I talk about. That took two more days, and he was successful. Day four went something like this. He took the knife, and he cut the the sinews and the muscles and the flesh away. Oh, Oh, golly, dear. And then... After he got that removed, there was two problems. One was called the ulna and the other was called the radius, the two bones in the wrist. And you know what he did? He took the knife and he broke them apart. That took another day. And at the close of day five, he was free. He fell down the crevice. He took the rope. Obviously, he had to stop the bleeding with the tourniquet. He took the rope, he propelled down the mountain another 60 feet, and he walked eight miles until two hitchhikers, three hitchhikers, saw him, called 911. He had surgery, and Aaron Ralston is alive today. And they asked him, as soon as he woke up from the surgery, they asked him this question, how did you do that? Well, what was your desperation? And he said, I did not want to die. The best that I know how would just shoot straight if it was just me and you in a room. What's it going to take for you to transfer from a walk of darkness to a walk of light? Can I go ahead and tell you it's the greatest life there is, the life in Jesus Christ. Can I further tell you it's the only life there is? Now, the Bible says wide and broad is the gate and many are going to this other life We talked about that Sunday night. Very few go this way. But the end result is Jesus, a wonderful life, and eternity in heaven. And what is it going to take for you to just say yes to the one who made it possible for you to even do this? Because he died on a cross and rose from the dead. What is your desperation? I close with these words. Besides the fact that I love you and I can't wait to see you again, but I close with these words. Would you please respond to the one who died on the cross for you? Can we bow our heads all over the building? Carol's carol's coming. We're going to sing the final invitation of the calendar revival it goes something like this we sing and and at some point pastor feels the invitation and the service is over because God has spoken to his heart and he dismisses and we go home 
Some of you need to rest tomorrow. Ron needs to rest tomorrow. But that's what's going to take place physically, but spiritually. Another day of decision is before you. So I'm going to ask this question. It's rhetorical. Don't answer it because I, I'm just asking. Is everybody in this building saved? Is everybody in this build? have you trusted in Jesus as your Savior? Well, Brother Ron, I know I need to go to church. That's not the question. Is Jesus Christ your personal Lord and Savior? Are you going to see him one day in heaven? Are you going to walk with him till you get there? Yes or no? And if there's somebody here that answers, no, you need Jesus. So, we're, I'm just talking to you, okay? Me and you. In, in the Baptist church, we have what we call an invitation. And the pastor or the preacher or the evangelist or several stand down front to receive you. And folks have come this week and they've come to the altar for prayer. And I want to invite you to come and take the pastor by the hand and just say, I need Jesus. Now look, look. My friend is thorough and my friend doesn't want to just say, oh, hallelujah, great, we'll, we'll recognize you uh, after the service and we'll back. My, my friend's going to talk to you. So he may set up an appointment tomorrow or the next day. He, he, he may hug me by and take you and just visit with you for a few minutes tonight. He's not the one that's going to save you, okay? But I want you to come in this manner because I want you to come making a public, a public, a public profession of your faith. As a candidate for baptism and a membership in this church, in light of, and in, excuse me, in, in, in conclusion with the decision to trust in Christ, because if you'll notice after we all got saved, he didn't take us to heaven. He left us here. And Pastor wants to talk to you about the abundant life part, the, 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 the serving Jesus part. We'll get the eternal life part squared away. And, and Pastor can counsel you and I can counsel you about that. But these folks want to be thrilled to know the decision that you have made and rejoice with the angels in heaven. So you say, Brother Ron, I'm, I'm nervous. I get it, I get it, I get it. So here's how we're going to do this part. And we're going to pray right now, right now. Pastor Keith, I want you to come. just come. Every head is bowed. Just come and stand here. Listen, if you need Jesus as your Savior, we got our eyes closed, okay? Would you just come and take this pastor by the hand and just say, I'm not going to go to heaven if I don't do something about this. I, I need Jesus. And pastor will decide the amount of time that might take place in days to follow, but the initial step of trusting in Christ. I'm going to take this a step further and then we're going to pray. Maybe you've done that, but you've not told a soul. Would you come and tell Pastor, I got saved last Tuesday or, or, or 2022 or 2021 and I need to get involved in a church and I need to follow the Lord and believers' baptism so the initial step can be taken care of tonight. Listen, I don't get notches on my belt or, or pats on the back for doing what I just did. I'm doing what I'm doing because I love you and I want you to meet my Jesus. But God loves you more than I could ever love you. So here's what I'm going to do. If nervousness is the deal, I'm going to pray, and when I say amen, we're going to sing. If you want to come now, pastor's standing here, and the initial step of trusting in Christ can be taken care of, and then the future steps of counseling, he can decide. Dear God, I thank you for the spirit that I have felt in this place since we started tonight. Great crowd. People came in eager 
to, 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 to listen to the, uh, the Word of God tonight. Dear God, I, I've preached many a sermon on hell and it's been tougher, than, as you know, than I've ever experienced because the enemy doesn't like it. And there's always a distraction. And, and, and tonight I felt so free. Dear God, the icing on the cake, so to speak, would be if somebody said yes to you. So I pray without hesitation in these next few moments as we sing that they'll come. I'm, I'm, I, I, I'm praying that folks would come to this altar and pray for lost friends that apart from trusting in Christ, they're going to live in hell forever. Maybe there's a family member. Dear God, would you challenge them to come? And we're going to sing as long as you want us to sing, and we're going to go home when it's done. Father, I thank you for what you're about to do. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Would you stand to your feet, sing the words on the screen, pastors down front, you come as we sing. Here we go.